Live in La Vida. Oh, excuse me, sir. Did I just uh, interrupt your snooze? My apologies. I shall leave you be. Because we have work to do. So, this is going to be one of those. I see you rolling. It is time. It's way overdue for a repot. You can see that the support, well, I know that it's been in here for three years because of the support that I used three years ago. It did not bubble or gargle when I filled up the pot with 300 parts per million of cow mag and 40 parts per million of seaweed. Yes, I went all in on the CalMag because I think what is going to happen here is carnage and the roots had already started growing. So I am way behind on this repot and I wanted to pump in some strength before I take it apart. Let me get you on a tripod. I may need to resituate as well, depending on how this wind progresses, but let's get started because if you have the time, we have work to do. And thank you if you decide to stay all the way to the end. So my plan today is film way ahead of time. Sounds a little bit silly, but happy Easter. Because if I get this right and I do it the right way and nothing comes in the way, then this will be aired on Easter because normally with big, big repots or cleanups like this, I listen to podcasts just to pass the time and not to rush things, just take my time. I forget time. But seeing as I wanted to repot this on film, I am not listening to a podcast, clearly. So what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit of an Easter story with a few little pointers. Oh, oh, I want to save my pot. I want to save my pot. Oh boy. Oh gosh, she is rock hard. Let me just scoot the camera a little bit so that I don't do damage on the leaves. Oh my goodness. She is rock hard. Okay, I'll be back. Bringing in the big guns. <laughs> this is a rubber mallet. But seeing as I don't have the strength in my hand to wrap and squeeze around a big pot like this, and before I go all ninja on what's happening inside, I need to, I, I wanna be careful. So my first port of call is to be careful. And then I can go radical, but initially, oh, Goodness me, what a beautiful sight. Lots of new roots in there. Which we need. So the CG Roebling grows roots just before new growth start. And timing wise, it would have been better to do this repot at that time. It just so happens that the new growth start at such a time when the climate is still too cold to go all radical, all out into a repot mode. The nights, the days might be tolerable, but the nights. And for that reason, I didn't go for it. And I may need to change that in future if I want to have an easier repot, I may need to change and think, never mind the temperatures outside or indoors. It's about the roots. So I have a lot of new roots that are in there that I would like to save, but I also have a lot of dead. Let's see if that did anything at all. Anything? You want to come out at all? No, you don't. Okay, let's try this. I really want to save my pots. I'm going to go along the side just a little bit. Not dig in and cut around, but 
to wedge the outside of the pot free. And I'm going to do it on the side where I see dead roots. Give me a bit more leverage. And I've used a round edged knife so that I'm not poking and stabbing away at something I don't see. And besides, my paring knife is a little bit too fancy. I shouldn't even be using it on my orchids, but it's the thinnest that I have. Oh boy. So while I'm concentrating on this, I know I haven't gotten into my Easter story yet. I had a most epic Easter in Kenya one time while I was at high school. But until I don't clean out the roots, I need to concentrate and not start yapping away. So I do apologize if you're waiting for the Easter story. I will put timestamps in the description below. Okay, I can hear something giving. I have two new growths to be careful of. Something I also don't like doing. I prefer to repot when, oh my goodness. Rubber mallet is a go. Note to self for future cases like these. <laughs> Saves me on the hands. Wonderful. Look, amazing. Oh, we've got a lot of cleanup to do and I still have root tips, which is great. But we have a lot of cleanup to do. There's some down there. And another thing I'm going to do this time is save my leka that is somewhat clean so I can separate it easier to something that is going to get really messy very soon. So you can see we have a lot of work to do. Dead roots, new roots, and a little bit of in between. And we're going to be taking away some of the back. I would like to preserve those new roots. I want to get a feel for where the new growths are before I start working. This is all good stuff down here, but I can forfeit that. So let's, let's begin. If you haven't seen any of my other repots, I have a whole playlist of everything semi-hydro, where I discuss what I look for in a repot and how I do it. Hopefully, saving as much of the root ball as I can while already planning ahead for the next two or three years with regards to what is going to come because of the attributes of the orchid and its future needs. So if you have any questions regarding this repot, please leave your comments in the comments section. Be happy to answer them. If you're squeamish about seeing good roots being severed, then I, there will be a timestamp as well to skip that part. But what I do is something that has worked for me over the years when it comes to this grow method to keep the overall health of the orchid intact. So there is a playlist and there's the comment section where we can have a dialogue. Right, while I work on this, let me tell you an Easter story if that is of interest. Did I say Happy Easter to everybody in the beginning? If I didn't, Happy Easter. Thank you so much for joining me on this Easter Sunday Orchid Repot. I appreciate it. I'm sure there's plenty of exciting things to be done. So if you did tune in to this video, thank you ever, ever so much. Once upon a time, back in the 80s, I went to an American high school which was a boarding school, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I never had issues about going to boarding school. I loved it. And of course you make a lot of friends there. It was an American high school. I made a lot of friends there. And I lived on the coast down in Mombasa, which was a great distance back in the day to getting home for Easter. So more often than not, I would either stay at school or go with some friends to their homes. They were all missionaries and hang out over Easter 
with them because it made no sense to travel down to the coast every time. Some years I did, some years I didn't, but not all the time. And there was plans and we wanted to hang out. So one of my friends, parents were missionaries at my school. They were teachers and staff. So they had home their they had their home on the campus. And I stayed with them over that Easter and the plan was to go down the escarpment into the Great Rift Valley and go camping. We loaded up on a Thursday very very early morning because to get from our school to the Masai Mara, which is a national park, it was actually down up the other side of the escarpment. It's long drive. I can't remember whether it was four or five hour drive, but it was a long drive because we had to, we were on the escarpment right at the opposite end, opposite side of where the Masai Mara National Park is. Beautiful, beautiful park, by the way, if you ever, ever decide and want to go to Kenya, my goodness, I can't recommend the Masai Mara enough. Full of wildlife. If you've seen documentaries on the like any nature channel or something with regards to, you know, the migration of the gnus, that's what happens at the Masai Mara. Those are main, the main pictures that you see when you see a documentary like that. The wildebeest, I call them gnus. That is the Masai Mara. Gorgeous, wonderful place, rich in wildlife. So we decided that we were going to go camping. And for that reason, I hung out with them over Easter. And my goodness, when you, you know, when you enter the park, it's probably more strict now back than it, it was back then. But we did still have to register at the park entrance and, and state our location as to where we were going to go camping. Just in case, we also had to tell them how long we were planning to stay and if they weren't, you know, it's just a security measure. If they were not to see us a couple of days after that, then they would know, okay, this group of people is out there over there. We need to go check on them because they haven't left the park. Just one of those little security measures. I bet you it's much stricter now. I'm sure that you can't just go out there willy nilly to go camping. Anyway, so we went and uh, had a beautiful location scouted out right by a sand bank of a river. Really nice. It's like a single lane with the grass tufts in the middle. So when you took the van and the truck over and you drove over that, you could feel, you know, the grass scratching the underbody of the car. And oh, it was just idyllic shade trees in the savannah just but there was that one little section of the river gorgeous and we could get our water from the river and we were planning so we left on a thursday and we were planning to stay all the way through sunday evening maybe monday i don't remember but in kenya the monday after easter was also a public holiday so i think school was out until monday when all the students were to return and we were going to return on a monday as well I think that was the extent. If any of my friends ever stumble upon this video and you were on that trip, then, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. So we set up tent, which was fun. I used to do tent pitching competitions with people. That's another story. <laughs> and it was just awesome, you know. Okay, April, it's hot. There is a rainy season in April, but you know, out there in the savannah, at least we had some water in the river. Sometimes that water is just non-existent, but it was that time of year. It wasn't flood weather or anything like that. And what we did, you know, was sort of made a group of tents. I was in one tent with my friend. There was another tent. Let's, okay. The parents tent, let me see, am I showing? Yeah, okay, design. The parents' tent was over here, and we're talking pup tents, you know? Just the little triangle tents. Nothing fancy, nothing with a front porch thing, nothing like that. Pup tents. Zipper up, in, zipper down, two bodies can lie next to each other, that kind of thing. So there we were. Parents' tent, sister and friend's tent, and on the opposite side, from the campfire in the middle, on the opposite, was my friend and my tent. River was over here. 
car was parked somewhat like that because it was like the, how do you say, was our stash, the food. And if we didn't want to sit outside, we could have, we could eat in there, etc. So it was like that. And the lane where we drove was, you know, just coming down to the, where the campfire is. So the lane was wide open, car, two tents, my tent, river. So I'm hoping all that is on camera. <laughs> it was awesome. Had our campfire, roasted the marshmallows as you do, you know, all these things that I was just getting to know as a kid, things that were foreign to me, all the American stuff, but it was good. And then we retired, stomped out our fire because we didn't want rhino to come because they are notorious fires, fire extinguishers in the wild. So didn't want to attract anything stomped out our fire and we retired into our tents and everybody was told to you know pipe down shut up be quiet you'd also don't want to attract any interest from the wildlife this was not an official campsite it was just something that we were allowed to do back in the day so it wasn't like we were protected from wildlife it's difficult to not giggle when you've got the giggle fits and that's what my friend and I started getting, as you do, silly youngsters getting giggle fits. And we could hear the parents keep saying, shh, you know, sorry if that was too loud in the mic, but they were shushing us to, you know, calm down, go to sleep, big day tomorrow, get up early, go on a game drive. <laughs> then, I think we did settle down eventually because what, what woke us up was the most horrendous, I mean, seriously, the horrendous, most horrendous sound. It wasn't lion. I mean, growing up in Kenya and being in that environment, we knew our animals pretty, pretty well. It wasn't a lion that had made that noise, but it was something that was in extreme distress, extreme distress. And then, then we heard the lions and the growling and the whatever was happening outside of the tent is what woke us up. It was that loud, that vicious, and something was in major distress. We didn't move. It's not like you go out and say, um, excuse me, what's going on? We're trying to sleep here. We did not move. It was still dark. So everybody just, oh my goodness, what is going on? And, you know, you ride it out, just ride it out. Don't even think about it. And then after a couple of hours, it actually calmed down and it stopped. By that time, dawn was breaking. And, you know, we want to get ourselves some chai. Like real chai, not the Starbucks chai. No, no, the proper chai. Cooked with raw tea leaves. Well cooked with tea leaves, but no tea bags, nothing, straight into uh, a pot with milk in there and plenty of sugar, tea leaves, milk and sugar, all getting it to a rolling boil and stirring and stirring. That's how we made chai. So the stuff that you get at Starbucks, and they call that chai, uh-uh, uh, I'll tell you about chai. It's good stuff. We were addicted to the stuff, probably more the sugar than the chai, but anyway. <laughs> Time to get up time to go out, which we did, unzipped our tents, and everybody's sort of like, you okay, you okay, yeah, yeah, we're fine, we're fine, okay, so what the hell was that, don't know, animal, you know, and it was actually the dad that said there was a kill at night, lions had made a kill, and it was close enough for us to hear the entire commotion of what was going on, okay, fine, everybody good, we got out, Let's get our day started. So we all unzipped and peeled out of our tents, wanting to go down to the river, which my friend and I did. We only got so far where the father did that noise again. I'm not going to do it because I don't want the mic to be affected, but it was a noise that you kind of agree upon to stop what you're doing at that point in time if you can't actually shout. All right? It's like when you have diving signals, you're not talking because you can't. You've got something, you know, the oxygen in your mouth. The same with being on safari, camping, whatever. 
certain sounds are there to address and alert as opposed to you know shouting it out because you can't based on what is around you so he made that noise and we stopped and we turned around like you know frustrated teenagers what and that moment <laughs> the what never made it to the T part because we saw what he saw from the tufts of grass that were all around us apart from the shaded trees etc if you look past that to where the lane was where we came in lane dirt track and the tufts of grass there was a massive I mean buffaloes are big but this thing because it was right across the drive that lane that we drove into our little campsite to laid there right across blocking everything no in no out it's not like we could grab the van and do you know a three turn and get out the terrain wasn't made for that and this buffalo had been killed the night before and it was like splayed across towards us guts spilling out everywhere i couldn't see that much of the detail because we were still a little bit lower than the body of the buffalo but we could see the blackness of it why we didn't look right i don't know when we got out of our tent we just said yep everything's good we turned left took our towels and went started down to the river and uh, like i said we didn't get very far until the dad said or made that noise so what can i tell you not just were the buffalo there but up on closer inspection you could see the tufts the little black tufts of lion ears lying in the grass but the tufts of the ears were scattered around the buffalo from the tufts that i could count immediately with a quick freak out vision, I saw about 10 lions, big, small, female, whatever. I, don't, I didn't care. But there, it turned out there was probably a pack of about 18, maybe 20 lions. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that was it. I looked at my friend, she looked at me, we looked at the dad and we, slowly walked to our tent slowly as in no rush moves no nothing it worked in our favor that they have a kill right lying right there in front of them and they were protecting their kill so there was absolutely no effort made to get to the car which was closer to the kill than our tents were uh, there was no effort made to make any kind of rash movement, even though it was, you know, the day was starting and that is when they, the lions, would go sleep. We started to move in slow motion because clearly we had to pee, we had to go to the bathroom, we had to do something, we had to eat, but everything was slow motion and it wasn't about watching your back it was about watching someone else's back while they were watching your back eyes peeled at all times no way were we leaving the tent unless we really really had to and then you can imagine the giggles again teenagers dumb dumb but what do you do I have this thing about, in my personality, about when I get nervous or scared or something, I start to smile like a Cheshire cat. And it's not like I'm making light of the situation. I just, it's just a nervous reaction of sorts that um, I can't help it. And now, now you've got a friend there, you know, enabling as well. I mean, I'm not saying that only I did it. But we yeah so on and off giggles and all that nonsense that you know really eh, you could have done without at the time it's probably best not to anyway like i said it was fortunate they had a kill 
it was fortunate that they were just guarding the kill and it wasn't about us. But again, they're very protective of their kill, so no effort was made to get close to the van other than what was absolutely necessary. And only at such a time where it was the hottest time of day when the lions normally just sleep. So we timed our little camping trip around the habit and the sleep cycle of the lions that were there protecting their kill. And then at night we retired relatively early because it's not like they come to life at night when it's dark. Oh, when the sun starts to set, like an hour before the setting sun, it cools down and that's when they start to become active. And everybody started to be feasting around that buffalo carcass. Yep, and the noise. In the tent with my friend, it was, we kept looking at each other with these wide eyes, you know. By that time, it wasn't like there was fear. It was just like, can you believe what you're hearing? Kind of look, you know. The noise was, I can only liken it to, akin to like when you watch very, very old, um, or let's say period movies of maybe the Vikings or some kind of barbarian tribe having a feast and just being grotesque about their table manners, let's put it that way. Um, the chewing, the chomping, the ripping, and yep, the burping and the fighting when they would start to growl at each other and, you know, all this was happening in the dark, but you could pretty much see in your mind's eye just by what you were hearing what was going on around that carcass and then they would start to fight and you can just you know how lions fight with their paws up and then they are at each other and you you know mane flying everywhere now i'm not saying that that possibly happened because basically i wouldn't know i wasn't putting my head out there but it, that's what it sounded like plus ripping flesh and then also the barking or the whinging or the whining of pups that may have gotten in there too soon before their time and then the parent you know having a go at them and it was just it was mayhem to hear all that and you're only like six feet away i i was I mean, at the time, was I scared? I don't know, maybe the youth in me was just like, okay, whatever, you know? You just know that they are busy with food, you're not it. That was the kind of the attitude, because if I look back and think back, I wasn't terrified. I, I wasn't terrified, it wasn't like I, I remember fear. I just remember the whole spectacle unfolding by sound. And then how we had to be, you know, slow-mo during the day, doing what we were doing while these beasts, and they are beasts, but I'm saying that in a positive way. They are so beautiful. <gasps> anyway, while they were busy snoozing, then we got to do our bit. But it wasn't, it wasn't a comfortable symbiosis, if you know what I mean. It wasn't like they said, okay, we'll let you do your thing if you let you know. Again, they're still protecting their kill, but my goodness, I will never ever forget the sound track, so to speak, of what I heard in those nights. And now you can imagine in, in April, the heat, the heat of the African savanna, and then you've got a kill right there. And yep, you know what's coming next? The smell. The smell of decay. I mean, these guys didn't care, but it was, I can't describe to you the smell. It, it waters my eyes to this day. You see, buffalo chew grass. Grass ferments in their stomach. So it's already quite a stinky business when a fresh buffalo comes apart and spills its gut of that fermented grass. It's pretty nasty stuff. 
and now you've got the heat on a carcass that is being ripped apart to some extent not everything has been exposed so it starts to bloat I hope you're not listening to this while you're having your Easter lunch oh, I'll put a disclaimer up <laughs> yeah it starts to bloat anyway they were still there day two we are now um that was Thursday we arrived the kill that was Friday day two Saturday and then we had a night you see lions don't like dead stuff so they'll 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 graze on it I mean yeah sorry they don't like decayed stuff so they'll they'll feed off of it the first night and then the second night it's the little ones that get to eat as well and then we had another night that was somewhat more calm while people were while they were having their dinner however those that have that were satisfied started to roam fun fact they'll stay around their kill but they start to roam and explore and they came to our tents yep that is when they started to sniff around our tents thank god they were satisfied I kept saying that they were satisfied. It wasn't us they were after, but their curiosity is such that then they come and explore. And the size of their paws, dinner plate size. So this is not like little lions. The paws that you saw in the tracks next day, they were the size of a dinner plate. Beasts. Our pup tent was shoulder height to them next to us if they stood and then they would start playing or fighting or doing whatever and kept hitting our tent I could feel either the back or the butt or a tail or whatever from where I was lying always slapping up against me and that is when you kind of freeze that's the point where you go I don't care if you've eaten or not because if you roll over in whatever little frolicking that you're doing over there having a great time while your babies eat of that stinking mass of whatever it is, well, the buffalo, then, you know, if, if you lose your footing, dude, and you fall on my tent, that means you're falling on me. That means you've crushed me. I think I was 13, maybe 14 at the time, maybe 16. I don't know. In the teens, somewhere around there. Not just short of graduation but I was probably a freshman probably yeah and that was the scary part you know you can't leave your tent because they're doing whatever they're doing you're, you're really at the mercy and then the sniffing and the pawing and we could see paw marks on the tent the next day incredible incredible that's when I was kind of like you know I kept saying to my friend if he if whatever rolls on falls on me i'm rolling over to you just be prepared and vice versa you know like that's really gonna help when you have some beast like that falling over on its back your little pup tent is not going to stand a chance so that was the second night and the third day when we got out unzipped our tents and had a look-see they were still there i'm like going guys this is starting to stink bad like really bad Y'all have got to move, you know? This is not for you anymore. They were still there. Ugh. So again, slow motion, same thing as before. Now we were sort of like, we know what we're doing. We, we couldn't ever go down to the river, river and have some fun, you know? No, nope. it was just... Anyway, we got through that day somehow. We got our feels with the lions. But then at that time, that night, the dusk of that day, when we were in our tent again, we started to hear more fighting and the hyenas had arrived. Because now we've got decay matter going on, which hyenas absolutely adore. So the fighting between the lions and the hyenas started. And we were going at it again. 
What am I going to do if that lion or whoever it is out there, you're bigger than me, you're bigger than my tent. I've got nothing but canvas between you and me. And they were all just, you know, no respect for our territory. Uh-uh. <laughs> we were like, okay, you, you, you do you. Leave us alone, you know, but mm -mm. they didn't have the same kind of consideration. I'm telling you. So the hyenas came. The lions protected their kill as they do. That's what nature does. The next phase of decomposition <laughs> started. It was just vile. I cannot tell you the smell. I cannot. Just, I, I, I don't even know if I, if I were to have the words, if I should tell you the smell that was by now. Oof, unbearable. The thing that happened that night while the lions were still around was it was, let's just say, the banquet of the barbarians had become a laughing stock scenario because the hyenas, their call to each other, that's why some of them are called laughing hyenas, do, do sound like they're laughing their heads off. And here come the giggles again, my friend and I. Oh my goodness. You couldn't make it up. You could not make it up. The, the hyenas laughing their heads off between the growls of the lions. I'm telling you, I, yeah, we lost it. We lost it. I have never had such a laughing fit because now, I mean, would the lions really know the difference whether it was a human laughing or a hyena? They sound exactly the same. There is no exaggeration when I say that, but it is their natural call to each other. And then they, it just sounds like they're messing with these big beasts and, and laughing their heads off at them instead of being afraid of them. What, what a trip that night was. It's like, I, you know, you know, I'm going to pee my pants. I'm going to pee my pants. We were laughing so hard in that tent because it was also a stress relief at that moment. Because the other nights when you have the giggle fits, maybe even the fear fits, but you're giggling, you know, you, oh, it was always, you had to contain yourself. But when the hyenas came and did their thing, oh, we just lost it in our tent. I don't know from all the ruckus that was going on outside. I don't know if others were laughing in their tents as well, but I, we were laughing our heads off, my friend and I. It's just, we couldn't help it. It was hilarious to listen to. Yeah, so that was night three. And then we didn't see as many lions on the next day. I think one or two little pride, one of the two of the little pride were still there, but it wasn't, it wasn't like you could see tufts of ears above the grass anymore. It wasn't that kind of lots of lions. You really had to say, are they here or are they not? You know, you, you didn't know. But what came, we're still not done yet. <laughs> What came, I think it was on the Sunday, were the vultures. Oh, then the hyenas and the vultures were having issues. Oh my goodness. We were just like, oh, okay. At least on that day, we didn't feel like we had to be too vigilant about the lions anymore because by the time the vultures come, the carcass is already so decomposed and degraded. It's not really a lion thing anymore. It's about all the other predators, you know? So the vultures are just busy with the carcass and it wasn't like, yeah, we felt a lot safer when they came and they were messing with the hyenas. The hyenas don't give a hoot about humans, you know? They weren't, they were protecting the carcass from the vultures. So that cycle started to happen. And of course the giggles and the laughs and all that business, but it was just gross in the whole time. This incredible stench was just permeating it was in your hair in your it, it you just felt like you were wearing the stench you know it was just oh incredible then on the monday when it was just vultures not hyenas because you don't want to get bitten by a hyena because you know they can have rabies too on the monday when it was time for us to leave the father actually said you know what i'm going to try something here because the vultures, again, 
they were just messing around with the carcass. Oh, it was disgusting to see what thing out and flying away with or shooing themselves away with and you know all the blood and guts on their head. Sorry, am I being too descriptive? This is an Easter story. It happened over Easter, I promise. It is an Easter story, trust me. But the, the visuals, I'll never forget those visuals. You can't make it up. You can watch David Attenborough and get a feel for what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but it was right there in front of our eyes. But anyway, so the dad said, you know what we're going to do? Oh, well, we? No. You guys stay in the tent. He was going to try and fandangle the vehicle, the truck, or the van, four-wheel drive thing, to such a way that it would be facing towards the lane, like exit style going out. Because, again, vultures aren't a threat. And he managed to do that. And at that point, we had the majority of the van protecting us from our activities with what was going on with the carcass. So the carcass was here, now the van was parked in our tents. We could kind of pack up with the protection of the van uh, facing the exit. And so we could do the trunk, and, you know, we could just get all our stuff back in while always watching out to see, make sure that no lion decided to come back just to, you know, be a pain. Not that they normally do, but who thought that this would happen so? <laughs> Anyway, yeah, and then we packed up and it wasn't really that difficult then to get out with the truck maneuvering between the vultures and the carcass on a part of the terrain that was on the opposite side. So not by the two tents, but on the opposite side in order to leave the campsite. And having said all that, we actually left the park on a scheduled day as we had when we registered on entry, but our camping trip was nothing like we had expected. <laughs> we just didn't. Yeah, we, yeah, it wasn't exactly. Oh, and we smelt so bad. It's, you know, I think we drove the stench home in the van as well. The stench of the carcass, it, it really felt, even like afterwards when I was taking a shower and etc. It really did feel as though I had the smell up my nose. I couldn't blow my nose enough. I couldn't, it, there was nothing somehow I could do. It felt like the stench was in my skin as well. Oh, it was awful. But it was such, such a fun experience. I cannot tell you how much fun I had. Because again, I did not register fear. Even as I relive what I'm talking about, I don't register the fear, except the night when they were horsing around back out there. And if one of them, you know, came in too, th too hard on the other while they were having their little fights and the lion were to fall on the tent, then, you know, we would have been, yeah, we would have been squashed. The, the weight, it, yeah, we'd, we'd have been, a, that's it. There would have been some kind of damage to limbs on our on our side not the lion's side so maybe that night it was a bit apprehensive but the rest of the time I did not I did not feel fear I felt an incredible amount of disgust oh it was so gross it was so gross seeing all that and smelling all that but the night of the hyenas is what I call it in my memory. The night of the hyenas. The laughing. And then my friend and I with the giggles. And then we could finally, finally join in with laughter. That was, what can I say? It was fun. That night was fun. Because it was like the hyenas were laughing away at these massive majestic beasts of lions. And just making a complete joke out of them. Even though, again, it's, you know, it's their natural calling cry or whatever. But yeah. Oh, man. Never, ever looked at a buffalo again without remembering all that. So as you can see, let me check the time. That story took 45 minutes to tell. I am still another 45 minutes away 
at least to getting this root ball cleaned up. So I will for now stop the camera <laughs> and get back to you when I am done with this and we are ready either to pot her up or divide her or make a decision as to what to do. So if you've made it 45 minutes into this video, thank you very, very much. And again, happy Easter. I appreciate that you did listen to my story. I'll be back. We have a clean rhizome. This is good news. So I've been pretty diligent, cleaned up the entire root system, took off some back bulbs because that leaf was failing anyway, and then the little seedling bulbs as well. Took those off, but it's okay. All clean. Now it's cinnamon time and then potting up time. And I've got lots of new eyes. Look at that. They're not progressing at this stage, but all this potential. Hmm. Maybe, maybe after being cut and destroyed, she would like to bounce back. And that is not a purple ring that's different. That is the color of the old rhizome around it, which is absolutely fine. All right, cinnamon, pot her up. Just a little hydrogen peroxide on my paintbrush for no other reason but to be able to grab cinnamon and get a good clump of it onto my brush, which helps me to avoid getting it on the roots as such. So that's the point of wetting my brush first because I'm very close to roots. I don't want that cinnamon there. And it's been so long in doing all this that the angle of the sun has changed. I'm going to set up in a different angle so we don't get any interference with sun rays. And we'll pot her up together for everybody that wants to watch me pot her up. And if not, if you've seen all this before, thank you very much. It's been a long video so far, and I'm still not done. I'll see you just now. Okay, just a quick different angle, simply because I want to show you what I'm thinking. Two years in this pot tops because of the vigor and the size of the roots. Otherwise, we'll be doing this again in two years. Big, big pot and I could say three years in this pot. She's already growing two new growths now and has potential for four more. So I'm gonna put her in the big pot right here and I have to prepare support for this now. Wow, okay. Right, first of all, I need to make these holes a little bit bigger my idea is not to use something that is so harsh that it'll break my knife. But I just need a little bit of a bigger entry for the microfiber. This is a 27 centimeter pot up from a 20 centimeter pot. Okay, so the difference with the size of a pot of this caliber, I don't make loops, but what I will do is fill up the leka in such a way that I keep raising the microfiber around the leka so that it stands up in a straight manner as opposed to the loop that I normally do for my wicking. Right, now to make a support that is adequate. I'm just gonna measure the length of my orchid. I don't need it to be exact but I, what I do want to do is save on some material I'm not going to put the support right in the bottom of the pot there's no need I'm going to have it at halfway and then the lecker can hold it down just do a little bit of saving on the assets here let's try that let's give that a go yeah that's good enough
All right, so what I'm going to do is actually plant her straight or position her into the middle of the pot. Gives her plenty of room to grow either way. And it gives me the opportunity to hopefully have some more growths coming and finding space in the back. That's the plan. Leaving her a little bit lower in the pot gives me the opportunity to raise her up afterwards. I'm just going to use the leka to help me position her. There we go. That's my third harm. Okay. Let's give her a bash. The first of the leka so to settle inside the roots as best as possible. At least get some of it down there. The little ones pick them out, roll them in. It's monotonous, meticulous, whatever you want to call it. I enjoy doing this. If you're still here. <laughs> Later afternoon in my time, I started this around lunchtime. I had an hour's break for a quick snack. But now it is late afternoon. The angle of the sun is absolutely full on my face. It's not the setting sun just yet. <laughs> We're not there yet. <laughs> okay, just hold her down a little bit because otherwise she will start rising of her own accord. This is my test drive for the Guatemalenses that is coming up. The rubber mallet was superb. I'll have to think of another little story. Of course, if you've made it this far, let me know. If you enjoy a little story while I'm messing with the roots, I can come up with some more out of Africa shenanigans. They can't expel me now. <laughs> okay, right now I'm just being a bit picky here because I don't want to have to do this again. She's been through a lot. I'm going to fill around with some more lecker, raise her up, and then we'll have a look-see. So, round the back is a cut. And I am going to now expose that cut together with raising her up so that more lecker, while I'm shaking, that's the plan, so that more lecker can go into the nooks and crannies of the roots. There we go. That is about the height that I would like. Let me see if she's straight. She is perfect. Seeing as it's late afternoon sun, she is going to stay out here. It is not that hot, but I want that rhizome at the bottom there where I cut her to dry out. That is fertilized water. Even though she's had the longest of soaks, with the calcium and magnesium and seaweed before, I'm still going to put fertilized water in as she is in active growth. Now, I'm going to be picking out from the surface here, see all those gaps there? That has to change, so I'll be taking my sweet time right now and picking out all the smaller bits of Leka and just feeding them in through those gaps which will take another uh, 30 minutes. <laughs> Meanwhile, I still have my growth. Yep, we did well. Happy Easter, everybody. Thank you very, very much for watching this video. It's a marathon. I hope that you enjoyed it. Despite that, I appreciate it if you watched it. Let me know what you think of my story or my repot depending on which timestamp you used. Have a wonderful, wonderful day, evening, morning, at whatever time you watch this. Thank you. Take care. Bye.